The calendar has changed. Pitchers and catchers about a month away right now. And having said all that, things shaped up over the winter for a lot of teams within the division. So let's take stock of the American League East and starting with the Yankees and where they're at right now. Are they the class of the division flash? And if so, by how much? Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt that they are, Bob, and, and I would say by a significant level. I mean, the Blue Jays have made some improvements. There have also been some subtract, subtractions up in Toronto. So you feel like they're going to be competitive. But you look at the rest of the division, the Tampa Bay Rays, you love their rotation. Can they get enough done offensively? Baltimore really hasn't done a whole lot. And, Jack, the one team that we always enjoy when they're good because of the rivalry, the Boston Red Sox, on paper, they just don't look like they can compete to me. They've seemed like a a wayward franchise this offseason they won it all in 2018 they finished in last place a couple of times since then so I don't think they'll be the team that stands in the way of the Yankees winning this division I think the team that could stand in the way of the Yankees winning this division is the Yankees because I agree with flash I think the Yankees are still the class of the division they won 99 games last year and that was with a huge chunk of the season where they weren't playing the way they had hoped and expected that they would you bring back judge you re-sign Rizzo. You add Radon at the top of the rotation. Canely to help supplement the bullpen. And in trying to win a World Series, the first hurdle that you have to exceed is get to the playoffs, and you want to win your division. So I still think the Yankees are the class. I think the Blue Jays are the team that comes in behind them. You look at their rotation and adding Bassett, I think that helped them a lot. But I think the Yankees might have the best rotation in the majors. Well, paraphrasing what Vladdy Guerrero Jr. said last year, they were ready for prime time last year. That was the year the Blue Jays were supposed to vault ahead. They didn't have some guys that lived up to their reputation. They have added Chris Bassett. They had traded for Dalton Varsho. He's got a lot of team control. Kevin Kiermeyer on a one-year deal trying to rebuild his value. And then Eric Swanson acquired in a trade from the Diamondbacks. But they always feel, Flash, like they take a step forward yep. and then at least a half step back. Yeah, and those are some interesting additions, right? How is Kiermeyer going to play in Toronto? Is that hip going to be healthy? Varsho, a guy that we don't really know a lot about because he played in Arizona, but the numbers are pretty impressive for me. Bassett as Jackson said is a good addition but the guy in their rotation is Barrios he has to rebound and be that that guy from a few years ago that could be the middle of a rotation force I look at their club Jack we we've been saying for years they're young they're dynamic they're offensive and they're explosive they're getting a little bit older and they got to find a way to do it out on the mound they were the trendy pick to win the division last year Bob mentioned Vladdy Guerrero's comments and I still think that they are a very solid team Barrios though is the guy flash what can he give them this year because he was a disappointment last year I look at the top of the rotation and Manoa that's a guy you put out there every five days and you just believe that he's a guy who's going to lead you should be an interesting rivalry between the Yankees and the Blue Jays this year it always is but remember this offseason Manoa called Garrett Cole the biggest cheater in baseball history uh -huh. not just in Major League Baseball in baseball history so we'll see how the Yankees address that but I still think there's a gap between these teams Bassett, another nice addition. I know in talking to Buck Showalter about him, he said you love the reliability of Bassett. He's a guy who goes out there and you know exactly what you're going to get, and every manager and pitching coach craves that. And you talked about this, too, and Flash mentioned it, bounce back years. For also guys like you say, Kikuchi, Hyunjin Ryu is coming off Tommy John. He could be back midseason. So, if they again, they're playing up to the back of your baseball card. If they can do that, that pitch, pitching looks a lot better. Yeah, obviously, they got to get better out on the mound because you feel good about that lineup every night, how it dynamic it is but you also have a good friend of ours and Don Mattingly up there as a bench coach right and he gets back now to a role as a teacher and a mentor to a young team I think that's going to be a nice addition obviously the players make the difference out on the field but bringing in a legend like Don Mattingly can only help them all right you also mentioned the Rays they're always I don't want to say they're a bit of a mystery but we don't know all their players what we do know is is that their starting rotation is going to be really, really good. Expected to be in a full season for these guys now. Shane McClanahan, Tyler Glass now, who only had two games started last year, coming back from his injury. Drew Rasmussen, Zach Eflin, Jeffrey Springs. So there's a lot of talent, Jack, in that starting rotation. And then again, you get the, that offense that usually seems to be just good enough 
to complement those pitchers with enough runs to get wins. Well, you look at those starters right there, McClanahan and Glass. Now you'd put that one-two up against any other one-two in Major League Baseball. Of course, they have to be healthy. Glass now was supposed to be healthy for the entire season. But one thing struck me about the Rays last season. I think it's something they need to tidy up. We have praised them incessantly for getting the most out of their roster and being the team that puts pressure on the opponent. I've always almost likened them to the team in basketball that would play pressure defense. 94 feet of the court. They're not letting you breathe. That's the way the Rays had played baseball. I didn't see that in 2022. A lot of defensive, defensive inefficiencies. A lot of vacant at-bats. You were used to them always having these quality at-bats and these productive outs. And Flash, I thought they got away from that last year. Yeah, I agree with you. But the one thing we've been doing for years is doubting the Rays and they find a way to be competitive. Kevin Cash is a proven manager who's going to have his club ready to go. The big deal for me is their shortstop, Franco. He's got to be healthy. He's got to be that difference maker that he plays every day and is a force offensively because we know with that rotation that we just saw, they're going to be able to start with the eye out on the mound and with that run differential and trying to keep the runs down. Their bullpen is going to be a bunch of guys that we probably have never heard right. about, but they're going to be coming out throwing 98, 99 miles an hour. I will never count out the Tampa Bay Rays. Now, I would say last year, one of the biggest stories in the division, and maybe in baseball, the way the Orioles kind of rose through the ranks and out of the ashes to be a really good team, really fun to watch. But, Jack, who are they this offseason, given what they didn't do? No major additions. They added three players on one-year deals, Gibson, the pitcher, being the biggest name out of all of them. And as I'm watching that unfold, I'm saying to myself, did the Orioles as an organization think that they were a year ahead last year? Because if you are an 82-win team and you think you can get a postseason spot, I think you'd be more aggressive in the offseason in trying to improve your team because you get to 87, 88 wins, you're potentially a postseason team. Meanwhile, they, they stayed pretty quiet. So I'm curious to see what we see from the Orioles. I am very impressed with Rushman behind the plate. When you have a young catcher who takes hold of a game, both offensively and defensively, the way that he does, that's a lot to build around. Yeah, I think another year of development for him as a leader, a switch hitter, a guy who's going to develop some more power. He's going to be the leader of that franchise for years to come. Now he's got to get the other guys to kind of follow his lead, right? They took that step last year. Brandon Hyde, their manager, started believing in the young players. They started believing in where they were moving towards. Now it's the next step. Can you win a few more games and make that a place that's attractive for some veteran free agents to come in in 2024? Now, one thing I do understand about the Orioles, they're, they're reticent to spend money. They got burned on the Chris Davis deal. That was a long-term deal. And maybe, Jack, they also believe that they have more young talent in the minors that can help. We talked about Rushman, but they bring up Gunnar Henderson at the end of the season. A couple other guys you know, if they want to build from within and do it that way and build some with some homegrown stars and Rushman is a big time one, maybe that's their tact. I'm sure that that's a big part of their philosophy and they know their players better than we know their players. But the Chris Davis deal, and you're right, Bob, it still hovers over them. It still lingers out there. You can't allow that to impact decisions about your 2023 team. That was a terrible contract. Probably never should have happened. But now that it hovers over your team, you can't let that, that prevent you from making other choices. They do have some very good young talent, but I think they could have helped themselves more this offseason. This might be a wait-and-see situation, yeah. right, where an organization says you have to show us the first three months of the year that you're going to build on what you did last year. If you do that, if you show the organization that you're ready to go, now it's the GM and the front office's job to bring in some veterans at that trade deadline to try to get you to the postseason next year they might have to prove themselves again the first half all right the other curious case within the division would be the boston red sox the theme this whole offseason is either jack they were losing players or they were just failing to sign players that maybe would come aboard and help them what they did do on a positive note they signed rafael devers to an extension that will cover the next 11 years so they locked up a cornerstone at third base that was the best move they made all offseason but i don't
don't think it erases some of the other moves. I don't think they were ever really in on Bogertz, and that surprises me. They were more than $100 million apart from what he signed with for the Padres. And I look at some of those other additions. I think they overpaid for Yoshida. I wonder what Turner is going to be in Boston. How much more does he have left? I would say the same thing about Kenley Jansen. I feel that some of the moves that they made were wayward. I'll just go back to that word. And I also look at their rotation. And we've talked about the Yankees' rotation and the front of Tampa Bay's rotation and Manoa leading the Blue Jays' rotation. Well, it's Sale, Pavetta, Hauk, Whitlock, Bellow. A lot, a lot of question marks there. Some good young talent in there. Sales an, an injury question mark. Pavetta had a good season last year, but the other three are young kids still trying to get their footing. Well, you guys know better than anybody. There's nothing better than Fenway Park when the Red Sox are good and the Yankees come in there with a good ball club. It's an electric atmosphere. Right now, their fan base has to be scratching their head. What is the direction? What is this organization trying to do? Because to Jack's point, it just seems to be scattered and all over the place. If Yoshida is a real player, okay, maybe we have something. But is Turner going to play first base? What, how much does he have left? Now you start looking at Raphael Devers. He's got to be the guy to carry you every day. He always had some protect, protection, Bogarts and Martinez. Well, now he's going to be out there on his own. He's going to have to get it done. You know, the one other thing that comes to mind, too, is the fact that Devers, surrounded by what is probably marginal talent with all of these question marks and then you weaken the bullpen by putting Garrett Whitlock in the starting rotation so it's sort of like you rob Peter to pay Paul and now how do you fill in the spots in that bullpen right that's why they go into this season as a curious a team as I think there will be in baseball I'm just curious to see how all of these decisions pan out because it seems to me that what they probably had as plan a really didn't end up happening because I don't think they ever intended to give Devers 11 for over 300 million. I think they got backed into a corner with all the criticism that they were getting for their offseason for allowing a cornerstone player like Bogertz, a kid who had been with the organization since 19, to allow him to leave. They wanted to make sure they didn't lose Devers, which is great. He is an elite hitter, but it still seems like a hodgepodge type team to me. Yeah, I'm going to go back to the bullpen. Kenley Jansen comes in on a deal. I mean, he, it looks like a nice signing on paper, right? But this guy is, has a lot of innings on his arm. He has reinvented himself the last couple of years. How will he pitch at Fenway Park? Again, a lot of question marks with this organization.